When you think about the date September 11th, I suspect that a certain year comes into your mind. That's understandable. But this morning, I'd like to take you back a few years, even earlier, speaking about his relationship with former White House intern Monica Lewinsky, President Bill Clinton acknowledged at a prayer breakfast on September 11, 1998, that his nationally televised speech the previous month, a speech about that affair, had not been, quote-unquote, contrite enough had not been contrite enough. Listen to how one article reported the rest of what took place, or at least a a segment of that speech at that prayer breakfast. Clinton told the religious leaders that more than sorrow was necessary on his part now. As the president put it, one of the things he should demonstrate is a genuine repentance a determination to change and to repair breaches of my own making, the president said, adding, I have repented. If you remember this event, if you were even alive when it took place, if you remember that you might also remember that, not surprisingly, the president's confession was received with both approval and skepticism. Whatever your thoughts are of Bill Clinton, his declaration of repentance on a public national platform, his declaration of repentance raises an important question. What is, as Clinton put it, genuine repentance? What is genuine repentance? How can we know if we've actually seen it or not? How can we know if we've actually experienced it or not? To help us think about these issues this morning, let's go back to the closing chapters of 2 Kings and to an ancient picture of true repentance preserved for us in 2 Kings 22 and 23. So turn there if you haven't done so already. Head over there on your Bible app or your, uh, uh, on your browser, 2 Kings chapter 23. Now, if we were just to sit here and I was to read through all of this, this whole passage, chapter, sorry, chapters 22 and 23 this morning, if I were to do that, we would see that the word repentance is not found in either of these chapters. <laughs> it's not here. So how can we talk about true repentance, genuine repentance, if repentance is not even found in these verses? Well, the word repentance may not be found, but repentance itself definitely is present. So repentance as a term is not present in this passage, but repentance itself definitely is. You may remember from last time how in chapter 22, verse 19, chapter 22, verse 19, That verse described Josiah's repentance. Through the prophetess, God declared to Josiah, because your heart was penitent, literally tender, soft, because your heart was tender and you humbled yourself before Yahweh when you heard how I spoke against this place and against its inhabitants, that they should become a desolation and a curse, And you have torn your clothes and wept before me. Because of this, I have also heard you, declares the Lord. In verse 25 of chapter 23, take a look at that. Chapter chapter 23, verse 25, we're given yet another description of Josiah's repentance. It says this, Before him there was no king like him who turned to Yahweh with all his heart, with all his soul, with all his might, according to all the law of Moses, nor did any like him arise after him. 
So here we see repentance. We see repentance described with a very common Old Testament phrase, turning to Yahweh. Turning to Yahweh. The word repentance is actually quite rare in the Old Testament. It's just not how the Hebrews talked about that concept, to use that, that ter- a term like that. It is this word instead, this word turn, that is most often used to describe what we think of as repenting of one's sins, to turn. It's a really helpful word as well. Listen to how the Westminster Shorter Catechism, 1647, captures this idea so beautifully when it tells us that repentance to life is a saving grace whereby a sinner, out of a true sense of his sin and apprehension of the mercy of God in Christ, does with grief and hatred of his sin turn from it to God. Did you see the word? Turn from it to God. But look with me at how Josiah's repentance, this Old Testament example of repentance, can teach us even more about genuine repentance. The first thing that we learn from this passage about true repentance, genuine repentance, begins with the truth. It begins with the truth of God's Word. Genuine repentance always begins with the truth. It always begins with the truth. This is what we learned last week when we talked about Josiah's repentant reaction to the rediscovered book of the law. Do you remember the story? They had found the book of the law stashed away somewhere, buried in the temple somehow, obviously neglected not missed. (laughs) It was there somehow. One of the priests found it. When it was brought to the king, he was broken over what he heard. What he heard about his responsibility, what he saw there about the people's condition, what he saw about God's consequences that he would bring against the people when they turned from him, when they went their own way, when they disregarded his law and followed the gods of other nations. So we see Josiah's repentant reaction to this rediscovered book of the law that was, we we believe, Deuteronomy, a copy of the book of Deuteronomy. We saw that in chapter 22, but look at the opening verses of chapter 23 this morning. We also read in chapter 23, verse 1, Then the king sent, and all the elders of Judah and Jerusalem were gathered to him. And the king went up to the house of Yahweh, and with him all the men of Judah and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and the priests and the prophets, all the people, both small and great. And he read in their hearing all the words of the book of the covenant that had been found in the house of Yahweh. That's the temple. And the king stood by the pillar. Remember, two pillars in front of the building, right? By the pillar, and he made a covenant before Yahweh to walk after Yahweh and to keep his commandments and his testimonies and his statutes with all his heart and with all his soul to perform the words of this covenant that were written in this book. And all the people joined in the covenant. Don't you love that picture of leadership? Josiah doesn't stand up there and start throwing stones, sticking his finger out, right, and and pointing all the people, don't you know what you've done, you fools, right? You've you've jeopardized, we're dead, we're dead meat, we're, uh, we're toasts. No, he gets up there, he leads by example because he understands who he is before God. He understands his responsibility before God as king. And he knows at the end of the day, he is an Israelite. He is a Hebrew. He is of a people who belong to God. So he he leads by example, taking this covenant before God. So here we find him reading this book of the law before the people. And even though it mentions all the people, right, it's Josiah as a leader 
who is still the focus of this section, both of these chapters. So, repentance, as we see here, is a heart response. We need to make sure that that's clear. When we talk about repentance, we're not talking about necessarily anything on the outside of us. We're talking about something that takes place on the inside of us. It's a heart response. A response to what? To the Word of God. To the truth of God. Just like we are seeing here. Whether, whether another person brings it to us, as it was done in this situation, or you find it through personal Bible reading, brother, sister, digging into God's Word, or God digs up, He brings to the surface that Word that maybe long ago was planted in your heart by a faithful teacher, by a faithful friend, by a faithful parent. That God may bring that Word up to the surface. No matter how the Word is brought to us, repentance always begins with God's Word. There is a so-called repentance. There is a so-called repentance that does not begin with God's Word. It begins with being caught in sin. Being caught red-handed. Or it begins with the desire to escape the consequences of one's sin. I don't like where this is going. <laughs> I'm trying something different. I feel bad. I'm sorry. Let's see if this works. That is not what we're talking about. Can God use those situations and put them on the right path? Yes, absolutely. You can be caught in your sin, right? You can you could be... Uh, hard as the Arizona soil, right, in terms of your heart. <laughs> and you get caught. And you're not interested in repenting, but when you're caught, all of a sudden, your world is turned upside down. Can God, God get a hold of you? Can He get your attention through that? Absolutely. But again, it's the Word that brings the truth into our lives so that we respond. Our heart response is to that truth. Only God's Word can reorient us back to God and His ways. All of us know, if we're being honest with ourselves this morning, we all know that we are going to struggle in this life. We are going to struggle. And we're going to regularly struggle. We're going to be tempted over and over and over again by all sorts of things that come into our life. Struggles are a regular part of following Christ. But when those struggles come, and when we succumb to temptation, when we give in to temptation, is God's Word present enough in our lives so that He can regularly use it as we regularly struggle? The struggle may be regular, but is the Word of God regular in your life? And that's something that you can begin to change even today. Don't wait for the time where you're struggling, falling into sin, trying to sort out the mess of your sinfulness. Even today, say, Lord, help me to purpose to have the Word of God regularly in my life. Whether, it be, whether it's Sunday morning, that, and then on top of that, taking the time each day to be in the Word. There's so many resources online for good, solid teaching that you can take advantage of and listen to. Good, Scripture-centered music that's there. There's all sorts of things that are part of a constellation of resources that we can have the Word of God. Scripture memory. Lorraine, remember when we did Scripture memory those years ago, right? And Lorraine got up here and she gave, you know, like many of you did as well, and you guys did, the, you quoted Scripture from memory. That was a great experience. It's a great experience when we take advantage of things like that and that we're willing to do that because when you memorize Scripture, boy, it's there. It's right there at, at your beck and call, the top of your heart, top of your mind, front of your mind. So there's lots of things that you can do to be able to bring the Word of God into your life in a very regular way because you will regularly struggle. Genuine repentance begins with the truth. The second thing that we're seeing here, and this is just all over this passage, this chapter, we learn from this what we learn about this passage 
uh, about genuine repentance is that genuine repentance means that our hearts do a 180, right? A 180 degree turn all the way around, all the way back to God. Remember that word turn. Look at verse 23, verse 4. We read, And the king commanded Hilkiah, the high priest, and the priests of the second order, and the keepers of the threshold to bring out of the temple of Yahweh all the vessels made for Baal, for Asherah, and for all the hosts of heaven. These are all false gods, Canaanite gods, gods of the, of the nations around Israel. He had them bring, the king had them bring out these vessels that were in the temple of God. He burned them outside Jerusalem in the fields of the Kidron, the Kidron Valley there, and he carried their ashes to Bethel. So what exactly is happening here? Well, like many of the kings before him, even those whose hearts were inclined toward God, Josiah had probably become accustomed to the idolatrous vessels and the idolatrous priests and the idolatrous high places that had multiplied throughout the land in the preceding years. Probably not dissimilar to pre-Reformation times in Europe where over hundreds of years things had just layered with unbiblical, unscriptural practices that people became so accustomed to them. And thank, but thankfully, God raised up men like Martin Luther and others who said, this is not what the Scriptures say. This is not what's there. And began to understand that these things, these Roman Catholic elements needed to be purged out of the church. These practices that were supposedly from tradition but in fact were not tradition rooted in Scripture. They had to go. We see the same thing here. Josiah recognizes that he had become accustomed to them as well. Hadn't thought about them like he should have. But when he's confronted with God's Word, when he's confronted with the truth of God, his heart is turned and he recognized that all of these things needed to go. As Josiah himself would have read in that book of the law, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 13, you shall fear Yahweh your God and you shall worship Him and swear by His name. He is the only God. The Lord our God is one. It said earlier in that same chapter. You see, there is no almost repentance. There is no partial repentance there is no pretty much repentance there is no kind of repentance i'm kind of repentant i'm basically generally repentant most most of the way generally in a you know in a big kind of vague sort of way no 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 there is none of that that's not what the bible describes your heart has either turned and gone the other direction, or it hasn't. Just scan over verses 4 through 25. Look over verses 4 through 25. Scroll down the screen if you're using a screen. Look at this. The sheer volume of detail in those verses, the sheer comprehensiveness of these verses is meant to tell us something about Josiah's heart. It had turned 180 degrees to leave even one altar, to leave even one false priest, one vessel to a pagan, to, an, to a false idol, would say something about Josiah's heart, wouldn't it? It would tell us something if he tolerated even one of those things. It would be like a supposedly repentant adulteress keeping just one picture of her former lover. Just one. Or a supposedly reformed serial killer holding on to just one of his murder weapons, right? Sounds ridiculous, 
That's what we're talking about. When our hearts do not turn all the way around, we find ourselves rationalizing and justifying this or that. We find ourselves minimizing our sin. We find ourselves making allowances, making excuses. But is that genuine repentance? True repentance is a 180-degree U-turn of the heart. It's a U-turn of the heart, an inward U-turn that inevitably leads to outward action, just as we see here. Now, let's build on that. A third point. We've talked about how genuine repentance begins with the truth, We've also talked about how genuine repentance means a 180 of the heart. But as we see in verses 21 through 23, genuine repentance leads to genuine obedience. It also leads to genuine obedience. So take a look at verse 21. This is what it tells us. And the king commanded all the people, keep the Passover of Yahweh your God as it is written in this book of the covenant. For no such Passover had been kept since the days of the judges who judged Israel. Or during all the days of the kings of Israel or of the kings of Judah. But in the 18th year of King Josiah, that changed, didn't it? This Passover was kept to Yahweh in Jerusalem. So not only do we read here in chapter 23 that Josiah was faithful to turn from the path of darkness, but we read here that he also proceeded to walk in the light. Remember, what we are looking at is evidence of where his heart's at, of what's happening inside of him. The writer's point here is not that people simply celebrated the Passover because they hadn't before, but that they celebrated according to what was written in this book of the covenant. It may have been that there were Passover celebrations in the intervening years, but it had not clearly been celebrated scripturally since the days of the judges, and those ended with Samuel. So evidently, as we heard from the final verses of this chapter, Josiah even outdoes King David here. David had not even done this. Maybe there was an observance, maybe there was food and drink and things like that, but they had lost the truth. They had lost an understanding of what God had called them to do in obedience to these holy days, specifically Passover. But think about what we learn here, what God is showing us here. What we see here is that our turning from sin is not aimless. It's not just that aimless turning and you just kind of run in another direction. It's complete turn. Our turning from sin will mean turning to and embracing God and the life that God has for us. To run from sin should be to pursue God. Let me say that again. To run from sin should be to pursue God. I know in my own life I've tried to run from sin and not pursue God at times. You know what happens when you do that? You set up an idol of works in terms of how well you're doing turning from sin. Because turning from sin becomes the main thing becomes that's what how you judge yourself and that's a works righteousness according to scripture rather than le- allowing turning turning from sin to be turning to god it's two sides of the same coin right we cannot confuse but i want to be clear about this we cannot confuse repentance and obedience repentance does not mean getting your act together okay okay 
there are caricatures out there in theological circles and in church circles that say, well, certain Christians believe that repentance means you've got to get your act together. And they're going to be fruit inspectors. And they're going to check and make sure that you've got your act together. That is not what we're talking about here. Repentance is a heart change. But true obedience is the fruit of true repentance. Genuine obedience is the fruit of genuine repentance. Didn't John the Baptist tell this to some of those who came out to partake of his baptism of repentance? Didn't he tell them to bring forth fruit in keeping with repentance? Not simply to come and get in the water, pat themselves on the back, take the sticker or whatever he would give. You know, I got baptized today. The t-shirt, walk away and say, hey, baptism of repentance, look at me. He said, no, no, no. If you're coming out here to actually, in, in a spirit of repentance, then let that spirit of repentance be seen in your life. Let it affect how you think about tax collectors, how much money you take. Soldiers, how you harass people, right? No, don't harass people. <laughs> you know, he was teaching them this idea that genuine obedience is the fruit of genuine repentance. Genuine repentance leads to genuine obedience. The full quote from the Westminster Shorter Catechism, the one I shared earlier, look at the full quote. It affirms this very idea. Repentance to life is a saving grace whereby a sinner, out of a true sense of his sin, her sin, and apprehension of the mercy of God in Christ, does, with grief and hatred of his sin, turn from it to God with full purpose of an endeavor after new obedience. The hatred, true hatred of sin springs from a love of righteousness. True hatred of sin springs from a love, even if it's a nascent love, it's just a, the, the seed of love for righteousness. It's a recognition of righteousness that the, this is the right way to go, and I am going the wrong way. I am doing the wrong thing. I am thinking the wrong thoughts. My attitude is wrong because we recognize the beauty of the truth. A final thought. The last thing that we see here from this passage is that genuine repentance does not always change the consequences of sin. Sometimes it does. Sometimes it can mend. It's the first step in a mending process, a healing process. Sometimes timely repentance keeps us from suffering, from the fruit of the sin that we had engaged in. But as we see here, genuine repentance does not always change the consequences. Notice what we're told in verses 26 and 27 of chapter 23. Still Yahweh did not turn from the burning of His great wrath. After that whole chapter where we heard about the king's heart felt response to God, his love of the truth, his covenant keeping before the people. We heard about his cleaning house, literally in the temple of Yahweh. His destruction of these idolatrous objects and places. His obedience to the book of the law in terms of the holy day of Passover, observing the Passover. After hearing all of that, the writer is sure to point out that Yahweh still did not turn from the burning of his great wrath by which his anger was kindled against Judah because of all the provocations with which Manasseh, the grandfather of Josiah, had provoked God. And Yahweh said, I will remove Judah also out of my sight as I have removed Israel and I will cast off this city that I have chosen, Jerusalem. And he will cast off the house of which he said, God said, I said, my name shall be there. The reforms made by Josiah did not free the nation from the consequences of its sinful past. The people's participation in the covenant, the reaffirming of the covenant, 
did not change what God had ordained. Why? Because of the hundreds and hundreds of years of covenant disobedience culminating in the wickedness of Manasseh, that king two generations earlier. That covenant disobedience that had been building and by the tolerance of God, the patience of God, he had been holding it back. It was still coming. Although Josiah would go to his grave in peace without seeing these consequences, and his contemporaries would as well, he knew the nation would not escape. Was this punishment from God? Yes. But we can also understand it in terms of discipline, of God's correction. The Old Testament seems to use language both of those, in both of those ways. Why is it important that we understand it as God's correction? Because the heart that humbly recognizes the error of its ways is the heart that humbly accepts whatever consequences God brings. It's another mark of genuine repentance, isn't it? If you are genuinely repentant, you accept those consequences when they come. And you do so humbly because you recognize that's what you, you've, you've sown the seed, right? You've sowed and you're reaping. You understand that it was your doing. It was your fault. And you do, you do so, though, recognizing that God has a purpose even in it. That God can take your repentant spirit and the consequences that you're having to live with because of the choices that you made and God can actually work them for your good. You can trust His wisdom, His sovereign wisdom in your life. A heart that is humbly accepting the consequences that God still brings does so because it's given up trusting in human wisdom. And it's now holding on to God's grace, His wisdom, His loving intentions for His children. God has a purpose even in the consequences of the sins from which you've repented, from which you've turned. Will you humbly bear with those consequences? Will you trust Him with those consequences? Knowing that even though you made the choice, that God has grace to be able to use even those to uphold you in the midst of those consequences as life becomes very difficult maybe and to see you through and to use them for your eternal good. Through Josiah, God has given us a powerful reminder this morning. But listen to how, I love how the prophet Joel when thinking about the story of Josiah, I love how the prophet Joel expressed God's call to repentance. He said, rend your hearts and not your garments. Josiah rent his garments, didn't he? Because his heart was rent as well. It was broken. But Joel is saying, don't just do the outward things. Don't look, don't try to pick up the look of repentance. Don't try to act like you're repentant. No. Tear your hearts as well. Let your hearts be broken over your sin. Return to Yahweh your God, for He is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. Maybe this morning as you sit here, as you're watching online, maybe you know that you're going in the wrong direction. You know the path of your life is not one set on a God-glorifying course. You know maybe the ways in which you are stumbling and struggling, the ways that you've given sin a foothold in your life. You know the complacency that you're battling with. Or maybe God has you in the process of turning even now that heart of that tender heart that loves righteousness and his ways and hates sin 
is welling up in you even now. Wherever you are, I want to encourage you with the words of Psalm 34, verse 8. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Taste and see that the Lord is good. You're never too far. You're never too far away. It's never the wrong time for repentance. Today is the day. Taste and see that the Lord is good. His grace is abundant. What do we know as we've studied the Old Testament this morning? What do we know from the New Testament in light of this theme? We know that only the goodness and beauty of Christ will help us to recognize the deceitfulness and ugliness of sin. That ultimately, only the goodness and beauty of Christ helps us to see the deceitfulness and ugliness of sin. Remember, repentance is the first word of the gospel. That's how important it is. It is the very first word of the gospel of Jesus. And the gospel is the power of God for salvation, isn't it? True repentance is not possible apart from the transforming work of Jesus. Only because He suffered in our place on the cross can our eyes even be open to sin. Only through Him can we be soft towards God. It's God, as it says, for example, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, that grants repentance. He grants us repentance. Only the power of Jesus' resurrection from the dead can give us power daily to hate sin and to run from it. Repentance and faith are two sides of the same coin. Who or what then is your faith in this morning? Who are you trusting? Who are you leaning on? What are you leaning on? God is calling you, He's calling me, He's calling us to repent, to turn. Will you consider this morning both your need to repent and your understanding, what you actually believe about genuine repentance? Let it be biblical. Let the Word inform that repentance. By God's grace, brothers and sisters, friends, may it be said of us, as it was said of Josiah, that we have turned and are turning to Yahweh with all our heart and with all our soul and with all our might. Amen? Amen.